Can we start with uh, some questions before we open it up? Um, we heard very interesting lessons already, but maybe if I can, if I can, if anybody wants to respond, in your view, what do you think are the future trends? We already heard about some of them. The opportunities and challenges, we also heard about them. But maybe if I can push you a little bit, what do you think are the key policy responses we need to manage this uh, transition process? Um, how can regions uh, be supported in developing regional development plans and set priorities for en energy transition? Um, how can it be uh, incentivized at the local level? What are the, what are the mechanisms and policies that you think are necessary to, to speed up either the transition or make it uh, sustainable and engaging with the local communities. I don't know if anybody wants to start a little bit about the specifics. Uh. I could start. <laughs> um, maybe I would like to, to repeat like our main our main me message as I explained it. We think that the transition to climate carbon neutrality will be a huge transition which will change a lot of the things that we are doing, energy producing and consuming today. So, um, in order to do it step by step, huge changes are needed and to do this you need trust in, the, with your, uh, in your society. It will not be possible without any trust to, to implement these uh, huge uh, policies. That's why we see like social, social support, civil society support as crucial to make these huge uh, steps forward. And just transition, according to us, uh, talking with workers, talking with communities, is a crucial condition to get the trust that's necessary to implement your policies. And that's like the policy condition, the pol policy context that we see as, as, as very important. We have, in my view, it's often, uh, sometimes I like to summarize it in a very simple way. If you go to the climate negotiations at the COPs, you see environment ministers. And they walk in the, in the hallways and they have a red line around them. A red line of policies that they cannot step outside. But these, these red lines are far not enough to get the emission reduction and the ambition we need. To get more ambitious policies, they need to talk with finance ministers, with regional development people, and with labor ministers. And that's what they should do by developing their new policies. Talk with labor ministers, not just tick a box, um, skills are being dealt with, social protection uh, measures are okay. No, they, they, they should do it in a more coherent way as we Recently, I have been reading the government agreement of Finland um, from last week, and this is one of the first government agreements that I saw that labor aspects will be introduced in climate and energy policies. And that's, according to us, the governance that we need, the way forward. Thank you. Risto? Uh, I'll speak uh, from the Finnish uh, regions point of view. I think the Finnish regions are very active to make these uh, regional strategies and take care of the different actors. I, I, will, I see as, as a reason uh, how to make it uh, as, as a somehow table where different actors are involved. Uh, and, and also the, we have a discussion earlier of the, of the social acceptance. I think the region also has the very important role. What is the acceptance of, of the, because if, if I look at our point of view, it's, so it's the growth and uh, investments and, and also the workplace, but you have to do it in the sustainable way and, and you have to have different actors on the table to have it acceptance. To, to, for these this investments and this, this, this growth. Um, and then you have to research and, and development. You have to make also some research, you have to make, uh, somehow support these this actions to make, new, to make new kind of things. I think this is one of, of, of the things also to, to, to do. And um, uh, I would say that uh, um, so I'll, I'll keep, come back for that. So I've, I had something in mind, but I don't remember now what was. What, 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 I'll, we'll I'll get back, back to you. Yeah, yeah. Just, Karen, please. I'll just um, 
building on what's already been sp spoken about, uh, I think one of the things that we're doing today is um, learning about what matters in every community across the world. Uh, we no longer can think about our own communities in isolation to wherever they, they, they exist, both uh, broader regionally or nationally, and we're now talking internationally. So I think one of the, the roles of policy responses is to understand where we can learn from practice from other places and we have a very strong evidence base about um, what directions, what action we take. Uh, I think that the, the, the idea of getting return on investment, you know, public funding is a really important source of opportunity for communities. And so if we don't really understand uh, where that funding needs to be applied and have a very strong evidence base, I think we, we miss opportunities, but also we waste money. And we've seen that in our own context in terms of wasted funds. So I think alongside policy that represents that, and I think the idea of an integrated policy approach, and we have a new minister that's been appointed to actually have a look at integration of policy across all state departments, and understanding the point being made that, you know, this is very complex work, and all of the actors all have a, uh, a role to play in an integrated system and so how do you enable um, state policies to reflect that, but not just reflect that at a very high level? What does that look like on the ground in communities? And the last point that I would make is that, I'll go back to the point I made earlier, is that we need to stop thinking about communities as places to fix. What is the message to communities about their contribution? Uh, it's not just about the large cities that are growing and, and where population's growing, but how every community um, can be recognised for the contribution that they make and elevate it up. Um, so that's, I think, the policies need to re be reframed in, way, in the way they're, they're considered. And implementation at the local level has to be the critical um, focus. Paul? Two years ago, when LKB turned 125, we wanted to celebrate that in what way or so. And that was during the... Uh, two, three years ago, during the uh, refugee crisis in Europe. So we called UNICEF and asked if we could give a substantial contribution to their work with uh, the young kids in this refugee and immigrant. And they said, no, we don't take money from mining companies. <laughs> and and I think that mining companies are sort of on the international level have a very bad reputation for good reasons. And I think the hope is that the end consumers will ask when they buy products, how is this product produced? What is the footprint? What was the social rules under which they are produced and so on? And I think it's completely right of the International Trade Union uh, to put up this sort of hard demand for transition that is not only socially acceptable, but a transition that will be so build a social stronger society for the future. I think that is essential because otherwise uh, the mining industry will uh, not be trusted and the mining industry is so, the need for metals and minerals in the future to build a sustainable society is so important, but we can't build a sustainable society on kid slaves in Congo. Thank you. Um, do you wanna? The word I, I was, uh thinking about this leadership also connecting to the regions and different actors, you have to take also the leadership. And another thing, what, what, what I had in mind was uh, the previous, so it's a lot of this information ongoing and, and how, to, how to get the right information about things. At the, for example, at the, in Finland, so it's a lot of this information going on, not, I'm not, don't mention the mining and extractive industry, but the, the forest industry, it's a lot of, this information just uh, uh, you have to do a lot of work. You got this right information, and you have to do very, very uh, proactive and a and, and, uh, long time of, of to get it right information. So this information is one thing. But we have to do that ourselves. Yeah, we, yeah, can't, yeah, we, we can't yeah, wait yeah, for yeah, others. You, you understand? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, in yesterday's uh, pre-conference, we also heard from a uh, representative from Bollinger the traceability around this mm -hmm. first point that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, exactly. So it's interesting to see both private firms uh, addressing. So now I'd like to uh, open it up for questions. If we can take uh, several questions to uh, our panel members. Um, now it's the time. <laughs> If we can have several questions. Please say your, your name. Hello, I'm Nils Olof Lindfors from the region of Norrbotten, the very top of the world, not coming from down <laughs> under. Uh, I have a question maybe mainly to Bo. Uh, I see that there is a big problem. Uh, at the far end, we can, I think we can trust the end consumers. But in the time in between, we have a problem, and that is that you are really top-notch if you look on CO2 footprint, climate footprint. But there is a problem. We have only one market, that is the world market. And you have to compete with big companies that are competing on the same market, but they are not under EU ETS, for example. They don't you don't have an international regulation regarding carbon footprint. How do you see on that? Can we find a solution that we have international regulations in some way that can cope with that problem? Thank you. A uh, short so, answer, I think it would can, be a good can, idea. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can we take some other questions and then we'll okay. go around? So make sure we get some other voices. There was a hand there and there as well. John. So I'm Karen Refsgaard, I'm from Norwegia, which is sort of a mini OECD in the Nordics. Um, I have a question to Risto mainly around the cross-sectoral collaboration within regions and with our authorities and in, in the municipalities. We know that they have a lot of strict sectors, services, business development, um, uh, school, education, etc. And it's all related, but very often we have seen that it's sometimes difficult to collaborate. And also as a region, you have maybe more uh, power when it comes to business development and initiatives, while all the social responsibilities, either at the state level or at the municipal level. So just a question about how you come around that. There was a third question over here. Hello, I'm Klaus Sorning from the Autokumpu Mining Museum. And, well, my question is, uh, Bo said that uh, about half of uh, the future metals will have to be from scrap metal. So, what are your thoughts on, like, the development of trash mining and mining the, like, trash piles of older times, so to speak? Okay, um, any other questions? In the back, just get a couple more and then we'll ask our panel to. Thank you, Wendy Tyrrell from the Development Partner Institute. And uh, we're an international organization. Uh, I'm based in Australia. Um, my question is to Karen. Uh, you spoke a little about the importance of listening and some of the things that you had learned um, that had shaped your thinking. And I would be interested to hear a little bit more about that, uh, what you've learned, um, because I think that is so key to developing partnerships and, and progress and we uh, often don't um, take the opportunity to learn so much. So love to hear about that. Any final questions? Okay, here we have one more. Dimitro Forne is my name. Um, I try to anticipate the session on lunch here. We have on energy transition for our colleagues from uh, trade unions. I saw a figure which is, seems to not be correct regarding Romania. It's not only 900 uh, places, uh, jobs, which uh, has remained in 2017. We have around uh, 13, 
34,000 uh, jobs uh, still in Romania. So I imagine it's related with your affiliation towards ITUC, but the general figures, uh, it's a little bit uh, different. Um, towards you is the discussion. How you see the concrete measures that will be applied in the, during the energy transition process? Because if we don't have a contractual basis, a social contract type of approach, the risk is to have very good, uh, very nice statements, but the solutions to be applied in next years, and we speak here about three, four, five years, because we have already these energy taxation, taxation measures, which are to be taken by the European uh, U uh, Commission, will impact directly these regions. And if we will not have a contract, and we don't understand what will be the measures, will be uh, financial <coughs> support or uh, national support, which will be uh, granted to these regions, nobody understands how we will manage properly this energy transition. Okay, thank you. So maybe we can go around the panel. You can uh, choose. I mean, there were specific <coughs> questions to some of you, but I, I'll give the chance to everybody. Maybe we can start with Bo. Yeah, we, uh, firstly, we would love a system with an international, for everybody, international tax on, on CO2, but that will not, not happen. As, but as long, the EU ETS system is the best we have, and we should develop that one. Today, on our field, EU ETS doesn't support the most climate efficient streams to hot steel. And we're trying to change that, of course. Then the end consumer, we don't know. It took like two months to get rid of the white paper thing filters you used for your coffee. And when the end consumer starts to ask uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, Volvo about the footprint of the car, it will happen very quickly because they have to turn. So I think that is very important. When it comes to urban mining, waste mining, we do, all mining companies do mining in their waste when the prices are high. Uh, and that is the oldest waste you have. When it comes to urban mining, the problem is we have produced a lot of steel during the last 20 years, the China boom. But the steel is closed into the buildings and the bridges and all the infrastructure, so we can't go there and get it out because then the whole houses will fall down. So the, the, the time between we mine it and we could recycle it could be like, 50, 60, 70 years before that is, and that why, that's why it's so slow in the growth of, of the scrap. And who is best on scrap today? Yeah, the countries that have used most steel for construction, house building, and that is North America. On second place, we have Europe. So the question concerning networking and cooperation and uh, the silos, so I think it's not so easy way. But the idea is when you are making uh, strategies or roadmaps or something, and you, all the important actors have to be involved at, at on the table and they can be input there. But uh, at the end, somebody has to be make, make choices. But you, when you are making this process, it's very important to, that everybody has possibilities to, to come who, who, who is influenced. Then it had to be also the open process to, to see. But it's not so easy one. I, I think it's at the end, so we are uh, humans, and, and so you have your personalities, and you can, you have to, in, in our case, Finnish research case, you, we are not so many people, inhabitants. In, in North Karelia, we have 170,000 inhabitants, uh, inhabitants, and it's easier to know each other which, which are, so, so it it's helps of this cooperation, and you know what to do, but when you are the bigger regions, a bigger area, so it's not so easy to, to be in, involved. For us, it's, it's maybe, maybe easier. But uh, it's not so easy way to see those. They still see those. I, I, I have to admit. Bert? Yeah, I would like to reply to th three questions. First, on the, the role of cons consumers in driving the transition. Um, I think consumers are an important actor, but it's clearly not enough. Uh, you also need politicians that need to take the responsibility and to, uh, that implement the legal frameworks that are necessary. Uh, specifically, 
if you talk then about global aspects, uh, what we cannot do anything about what's happening in China is always the excuse. Um, we plead at very at the UN level for um, due diligence in the complete value chain that uh, companies are responsible for all aspects, also for subcontractors. Uh, on all the aspects as well as social as environmental and we are pushing very hard to this uh, to, to make progress on this that they are accountable for the environmental and social impact everywhere in the world for the, the products that they put on the market. We also have instruments for that, global, global framework agreements. That's where unions and multinational companies sit together and agree on uh, the, the, the rules of the game in terms of social policies. On the aspect of listening to the people um, and, and what can you learn and how can you organize it. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, for us the crucial aspect is social dialogue. That's the tripartite instrument where you have governments, businesses and unions sitting together and talking about the policies that are necessary. Um, but in many countries, social dialogue is not so well developed as it's here. And also, you can be at the table, but if you don't have any knowledge of the, the, the context or if you don't have any power, so it has to be combined with uh, many other aspects to be an important voice at the table. Social actions, uh, strike, marches and so on, you know unions do that, that kind of things. It's to have a stronger voice at the table. And then finally, on, on the, the, the mining jobs in, in, in Romania, um, the figures that I presented were from the EU, so it was not anyhow linked to our organization. Um, so I'm very curious to learn at lunch about the, the Romanian context. I think that the context, how you implement these climate policies and take into account everybody is extremely important. We have seen the bad example from France, where the, the yellow vests were, uh, appeared due to uh, CO2 taxation that was perceived by big parts in society as a bad measure that was affecting them, while the rich, rich were going uh, flying all over the world on, on cheap Ryanair tickets. Um, so this is an important aspect of the discussion and fairness. Um, is crucial to get the ambition we need and to get fairness, everybody should be at the table. Karen? Uh, just building on again uh, the conversation here, look, uh, answering the questions about collaboration and listening and learning, um, I think, I think our, our experience tells us that we say these things but do we do them very well? Uh, it, really demonstrating to people that uh, we, we work with, with them on the lead that they want to have is really, really important. So I've just picked up the power and knowledge base. So it's not enough to ask people what they want. It's, it's what, people, what matters to people. So going back to what we've done over two and a half years, we speak to as many people as we can every day. So we have an open door policy, but we go to formal sessions. We, we, we talk to small groups of people. People come in the door, we talk to businesses. So across all of the actors in the community, um, who is our community, uh, we take every opportunity to ask questions and listen. You build a very, very big uh, base of knowledge about what matters and, and it doesn't matter who the person is. The question though becomes, what do you do with that? And how serious are we in saying, um, let's work on things that matter to you? So I think our experience then is that it's not enough to ask that, it's then what the knowledge base is. So how do you understand and, and build a shared knowledge base about those things and that it's informed discussion and it's not just discussion, it's, an, it's action orientated. So we go to many meetings and some meetings you walk away and say, so what? But this is not about that way of working. This is about bringing people together to let's work on this together. It matters to us. We feel very strongly about it. And what can we do to bring in the knowledge and to, uh, to investigate its potential based on a very strong knowledge base? So it's finding those things that you can then really, really go hard at. Um, and it doesn't matter where you start. So I'll give you two examples. Um, uh, health industry, the industry came to us saying, no one's listening to us about what training we need for the future. 
and they haven't for a long time. So you bring local government together, you bring state health departments together, you bring the industry together at the table, you bring researchers together at the table, and you bring the community together at the table and say, here is a problem, here is an opportunity. We've now had local investment from the industry of $100,000 into some research, which has never happened before. People are sitting at the table together who have never been at the table working on something that matters to them. Uh, that's one example. Uh, so I think it's about real things and real action and facilitation becomes really important. So somebody's got to do the work of finding these opportunities and bringing people together in a way that is about shared responsibility and not worrying about who you represent. So this is a really important point for us. You're not here for your own organisation. What you bring with your organisation is a whole lot of things, but you are here for this community and your contribution to this community. And that's, that's a really important point to test that out. And that's hard work because that's not normally the way we work. We, wanna, we want what's best for us, but not for the collective benefit. So um, I hope that's answered that question. Okay, I think we have uh, time for a quick round um, for a couple more questions. Um, I've got one over there. <coughs> And maybe a couple one or a couple another one. Uh, thank you. I am uh, Karin Buman, a professor at uh, Copenhagen Business School, which is a business school that has a strong commitment to sustainability. And my pre my question is mainly for Bert, actually, because I noticed you re you you talked about due diligence, and I um, I understood your statement as. Um, as, as referring to due diligence as a process for companies to identify and take account of the risk that they may, may cause to society. So in line with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and in, in this increasing um, focus on, on that particular understanding of due diligence. However, in my experience, when we talk to a corporate uh, setting, many people understand due diligence in the more conventional way, which is to identify and assess and manage risks uh, caused to the company by society. So it's like a completely different, a, a 180 degree different focus on risks. And although I recognize that ideally all of these should be um, be, be integrated, I, 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 I would really like you, uh, my question to you is whether you would like to clarify the focus that you have and also clarify your experience to talk about your experience in meeting with um, with uh, company managers and other professionals like lawyers and accountants. I have my I, I, I myself have, have, am a law, a trained a lawyer, so I'm used with to people thinking about due diligence as protecting the company against uh, risks. Just for maybe people around in this room to appreciate the um, the diversity, the emerging div diversity in this term and its application, also in terms of social expectations expectations of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. There was another uh, question over there. Somebody put their arm up and put it down. Back on the last table. Hi, uh, my name is Arvid Stjernström and I'm a PhD student from uh, the uh, SLU. The, Swedish University of Agricultural Science in Rural Development. Uh, and I'm wondering on uh, thinking about this about, um, on dialogue and, and inclusiveness. Um, and I'm, I, I think it's mostly directed to Karen, but um, in this, having people together uh, talking about this, uh, I'm thinking about when we, there seem to be a need to establish more mines, uh, as we've seen in the presenta previous presentations. We need to increase the amount of metal produced. Um, but in the situation that you can't really find a common solution, I mean, locals saying that we don't want to mine here, uh, is there a risk for manufacturing consent uh, in these situations? And how would you go about to sort of tackle that. Uh, I think that's my question. Yeah. Any other last minute burning question? Your last chance before we close the, the round? 
Okay, so there was a question for Bo and Karen, so maybe I can ask both of you to address some of those. And then for Bert and uh, Risto, if you want to make any final conclusions, this is also your chance to, please. Yeah, in establishing new mines, I, I, first of all, I think that small mining companies are all over the world everywhere and try to get um, uh, permits to, to do exploration. And I think, basically, I think that is good. But I think one should, shouldn't start in the city centers of our capitals. One should start in the areas where we know that is rich of minerals. Minerals in Sweden, we have like three areas. We are in the middle of one of them. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we have enough challenges there. Because the reason is for that is that their people are more used to mining. Uh, and I, we have seen examples in Sweden when they wanted to explore or maybe also open a mine that the system for and the transparency around the uh, dialogue on local level has been really bad. Getting better by the years, but like five, ten years ago, it was horrible because mainly the exploration companies said to the local people, this isn't your business. And that is to call for war. And that happened. Do you want to say anything on due diligence? Yeah, um, I have to admit that it's not my speciality uh, team. Um, basically, it's about making companies accountable for the actions that they do. One of the most important uh, events that, that happened in this uh, sense was the Rana Plaza disaster in, in Bangladesh, where thousands of uh, textile workers uh, were killed in a, in a fire. And then afterwards, we see the whole process where we try to organize making these fashion brands responsible for the industry that um, the subcontractors that they use for their products. It's, it's extremely complicated. Um, this business, for example, uh, spent, was, was eager to, the fashion industry put hundreds of millions on the table when the Notre Dame in Paris was burned down, but uh, this was many, many, many times more the total amount that they committed to compensate the workers in Bangladesh that, that, and their families that uh, died uh, from, from the, the terrible disaster there. So what we're talking about is because it's not a black and white situation, I, I agree completely with that. Um, how can we avoid that private initiative is privatizing the benefits and socializing the, the, the costs of transitions? If you see in the Latrobe Valley, you had a, a, a company, Engie, that closes on a four-month, five-month notice uh, uh, a company, and you have to see the, the, the local government having to step in to solve the economic fabric of that region. So Engie is not uh, having, I, I, I would be curious to, to know what the commitment of Engie is in, in the, the social and economic development of the region after they, they easily left the, 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 the area there. So due diligence processes for us are rather broad and we have hooks in international processes at the ILO, in the OECD, to, to make them uh, more effective. But uh, I have to agree that it's a very complicated uh, exercise. Karen? You want to uh, just lastly, uh, going back to your question about conversations and people connecting, um, I, I had the example up in one of the photos of um, some people having a look at renewable energy as an opportunity in our community. and. It's really interesting in a very diverse community that there were people who'd never met each other before um, that that um, event, and it's finding through networks. So, uh, how do you how do you find people in your community who are doing some really wonderful things that go under the radar? And so, it's by working with people and saying through their networks, who else should we be talking to, and who else would they be talking to? So gradually growing connections through networks that already exist in the community and, and revealing where those opportunities are becomes really important. But then bringing people together to really understand those opportunities and get commitment to those, I think, is the way of working that we're really understanding. But it's also about building the support for those leaders in the community 
um, who can take lead and, and demonstrate uh, the benefit, the collective benefit. Uh, I think this, this idea of discovery in a community is really important for the first steps of really understanding what the potential is. Because we tend to go to the usual people all the time and we don't really understand the potential within a community unless we start to have those serious conversations. But got to, it's got to lead somewhere and it's about then how do you support those initiatives and then how do you financially support them but also bring in other expertise to support that. So you go to a different lots of connections then. So if you end up with something that people think is a great idea and we want to pursue it, it's then going to other networks, whether they're internal or whether they're at a university or whether they're international and how do we build those interconnections for things at a local level that then contributes to um, the success of that. So it's a very uh, you know, complex but um, systematic way of, of bringing people together from a very initial idea right through to quite a complex uh, connection. Crystal, any remarks? I'll come back uh, to the information and this disinformation. So we have noticed that, for, for example, in our regions, when we have had uh, quite a centuries or 100 years of mines, so people are inhabitants are familiar, what does it mean? And, and there you have seen the miners and also the technology and what they are doing. But some of the neighboring regions, they don't have maybe this kind of, of history and background. And I have noticed that in some of the areas you, you, you just uh, make your opinion or, or on some of the things before you already know what is the impact. So, so this information, you have to be open, you have to be uh, in advance that those who have against, of, you know, so they, if they just uh, give their information, uh, it's, it's not so easy to later on to say what is the process, how it's go, go on. So it's the information, this information is very important to, to have a research-based good information as early as possible. Thank you very much. I think we're going to come to the close of this uh, first uh, panel.